Good morning, folks in Calgary and beyond. This is the, uh, I think it's about the 10th annual CARA Technical Conference. Usually we hold these conferences in association with our spring flea market, which was scheduled for today, but <laughs> we all know why that isn't happening. So this is our first attempt at a, uh, at a teleconference uh, using a Zoom uh, meeting. And so uh, the uh, people are joining us uh, through Zoom meeting. And also uh, uh, we are streaming this uh, and um, you can uh, get the link to, to the live stream. Although if you're here in the conference, you don't need it. And if you're hearing me, you're already there. But th we put it out on Twitter both on the uh, Kara account and also Vince Dion has put it on his Twitter account, the link to the um, uh, online uh, live stream. So for those of you who are joining us here in the Zoom meeting, we got a couple of uh, housekeeping items to tell you about. Um, the host has uh, uh, muted all microphones and uh, we're asking you to all turn off your videos as well just to keep the bandwidth down so that um, we uh, 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 don't have too much latency. Uh, we're going to um, uh, have three presentations, one at 8 a.m. and it's about, I'm about to start with a presentation on APRS. At 9 a.m., Vince, VE6LK, is going to give us a, pr a presentation on um, uh, network analyzers. And then at uh, 10 o'clock, we have a presentation from uh, John in uh, Georgia, who is uh, uh, an, a uh, well-experienced DSTAR user on DSTAR Basics. Throughout these, then, the structure is going to be about a 45-minute uh, presentation, followed by about five minutes of question and answer, and then a 10-minute break until the next presentation starts. So without uh, any further ado, uh, let's uh, see if I can share my screen and we will start on the first presentation. So welcome everyone. Okay, Dana, can you let me know, uh, is, uh, is that showing properly on the shared screen? That's looking good on the Zoom meeting, yep. Okay, very good. So welcome to the CARA Technical Conference, the APR and my presentation this morning. I am Peter Barry, Victor Alpha 6, Papa Julia Bravo, and I'm speaking to you from Calgary, from my home in Valley Ridge in Calgary. And uh, welcome to the 85 members of the uh, that have um, joined us on the Zoom meeting and uh, the unknown number who may be following this live stream on, uh, on YouTube. So my presentation this morning is on APRS basics and messaging. And let's talk about what the, the um, uh, why don't we see this advancing? What is happening here? This worked perfectly during the rehearsal. There we go. One of the topics of discussion this morning and uh, the basic uh, idea here is that we're going to talk about uh, APRS on, on two different levels. One of them is a basic level for people who haven't uh, seen it before, but I hope that's also uh, uh, going to give some uh, new information perhaps for uh, um, uh, more experienced operators. You never know what you might pick up. And then following that first part, which will take about 20 minutes, then we're going into uh, a, a more advanced on a little bit more advanced discussion on messaging, which I, I think is one of the uh, most interesting and useful features of uh, APRS. So the first part of it is going to be a discussion about what is APRS. Uh, uh, some, uh, it is uh, talking about basic packet radio and TNCs. Uh, what is the equipment and software that you need? to uh, run uh, APRS. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a digipeter and a NIGATE and what are some of the uh, software uh, things that you can use to access the data that's in the APRS network, principally APRS.fi. The second part of the presentation is going to be more detailed and it will be about radio, about messaging, 
And there, we're going to talk about three different kinds of messaging, radio to radio messaging, radio to SMS texts, and radio to email. Now this is um, um, uh, all presupposing that we're not going to use the internet unless uh, noted otherwise. So this is, a, this is a system that works when the internet is not present. So when you're out in the hinterland away from a cell phone signal or when the internet is, internet is down under, uh, under emergency conditions. Okay, so what is APRS? It's the Automated Packet Reporting System. It's a digital real-time communication system that will share tactical information, telemetry, and messages. It was invented by Bob Brunega, uh, WB4APR, and that's him on the right there in this photo. And he is a professor and a researcher at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. And he started this in the mid-1980s. It, it matured, it developed through the 90s, and it has remained almost essentially unchanged since about 2000. So for more than 20 years, in fact, in 2001, and 19 years ago, they wrote down the APRS specification, which you can get as a document online. And, it's, and, and I think it hasn't been revised since. There's been a little bit of supplementary changes, but not much. So basically it's remained the same. It's built on packet radio. Those of us uh, who have been long, uh, licensed long enough remember packet radio. It's not used much anymore. Um, it's based on a, uh, on a digital protocol uh, called the AX.25, AX25 packet protocol. It's an ad hoc network, station to station, and it uses digipeating. And it needs something called a terminal network controller, okay, a TNC. So you hear talk about TNC. There's got to be a TNC present in the system somewhere to translate your voice um, audio into digital packets and then send out those packets over the airwaves to, uh, to a receiver. Okay. And what it is, it shares real-time tactical information. So everybody's on 144.39 simplex in North America. It's a different uh, uh, number in uh, frequency in Europe and in Australia. But here in North America, we use 144.39 simplex. So simplex. And uh, what we, the system announces your presence. It says, hey, I'm on the air. And this is where I am. You know the phenomenon. You go on the radio here in Calgary. There's got to be 20 or more different repeaters. And uh, you never know. Uh, you, you know by habit which people are probably on which repeater. But you don't know that for sure on any given day that anybody's around. So you put out a call. Well, the point is that with the APRS system, uh, when you go on, you can tell everyone, hey, here I am. I happen to be on the air just now. And, uh, and I'm listening to repeater uh, X, Y, Z, okay? And for the repeaters, a, a, a packet of information can be put out that for all users that will tell you what are the repeaters in the area, what's their frequency, what's their offset, the tone, so that you can use them. You can also put up information about, uh, about locations, uh, events. You can say what's the location, what's the information about the event. The, it can contain inf <clears throat> excuse me, information about weather or other telemetry. So the um, station uh, IDs that are associated with, um, with APRS are in the format of a call sign and a suffix. Okay, the suffix is called the SSID, your system information designator, SSID. That's the, that's the, da uh, the dash nine that's on the end of there. There is an intelligence in that uh, suffix, uh, and not everyone uses it, and it's not mandatory, but it is recommended by Bob Bruninga, and is in fact available, the, the various recommendations are available on the APRS, uh, dot, uh, I think it's dot org, but whatever, the official APRS website. Some of the ones that are designated is uh, uh, that, we, that we'd like to standardize on, and it helps for other people. Use dash seven if you're on a walkie-talkie or an HT. Use dash nine. Dash if your primary mobile in your vehicle should be on dash nine. 
So that tells people this is my primary mobile uh, uh, and uh, usually uh, that primary mobile is, uh, is uh, message capable. Uh, DOS 10 for internet, DOS 12 for other uses. There's a whole list of them, right? The system makes use of something called a digipeter. So what is a digipeter? Uh, it's a digital repeater. It's just a combination of the two words. And what it does is uh, a digipeter will receive a beacon that's been sent out by an APRS radio and retransmits it. So it's just, uh, it just takes it in, puts it out. And it, and it's, um, and there are, uh, it's got a um, system within its software to avoid clashes. Okay. Uh, what is an eye gate? An eye gate is an APRS session station, usually also a digipeter with an internet connection. And uh, what it does is uh, it uh, sends out, uh, it receives beacons and then transmits them on into the, um, into the IS, the internet system. So eye gates can be either one way or two way and I don't see a lot of point in having a one way eye gate. Uh, the, uh, some people have put them up, but the, the, uh, the terrible thing about that is that it, it, it stifles outgoing messages back to, uh, to the radio from the IS system. Um, I'm just going to take a little quick pause here to make sure that everything is still going okay. Uh, Dana, are you? Um, uh, uh, get, are we still uh, going okay out to the uh, to the users? Yeah, we're out to the out to the world, and I uh, see a couple people in the chat. Okay, good. All right, we're carrying on. So, if an eye gate is, we were talking about eye gates, and uh, if an eye gate is two way, then it receives messages routed to APRS stations from the internet and transmits them back out on RF. So, the idea is that you, your radio blasts out a little packet called a beacon, and it goes boing, boing, and it hits another station and when it and that's an eye gate, and then it, and then it gets captured, sent into the uh, into the internet. And then if somebody wants if somebody wants to send a message to you from the internet, then it, uh, it goes uh, into the system and the eye gate says, hey, I remember uh, Peter was, uh, I heard Peter five, five minutes ago. He's obviously within range of me. Uh, that's what the eye gate is saying to itself and it's a, a little digital mind. And it sends out the message to, uh, to Peter on, on uh, radio. Examples of an eye gate here in Calgary are these uh, are the Calgary uh, at uh, the V6RYC on Nose Hill, and Pigeon uh, is also an eye gate on uh, the Pigeon Mountain site, which is above Canmore. Okay, now the beacons that are sent out are highly structured and they're defined by the APRS protocol. Now each beacon contains the station ID of the sender and a definition of how many repeats that should get because uh, we don't want them bouncing around all over creation. Okay, it usually it contains your position, the speed and your course if you're moving and it can contain uh, messages that include the voice frequency that you're listening to. They can have custom information have telemetry about the battery conditions at the site or uh, numerous other things. You can have weather station information. Now here at the bottom is an example of a, of a raw packet and it was uh, sent out um, and it has a wide one, wide two tells how many hops that it's going to have so we will more about that shortly. And um, you can see that it contains 146.85 megahertz T110060. That's the offset. Um, this uh, is information that um, uh, that allow that uh, it can be automatically inserted into the beacon and tells you uh, tells others what your voice sound if your radio is listening to. And you can put in your own custom comment. I put one in here that said "scanning Calgary repeaters." Okay. A very important thing is that a beacon can be an emergency beacon. Inside the beacon packets is a definition of a thing called mic E status. It's coded right in and with a very structured uh, code. And other radios and software on the internet are, are watching and parsing 
that particular piece of code inside the packet. And one of the, the uh, uh, pieces of information, one of the settings for your Mikey can be emergency. Uh, <clears throat> on my particular radio, if it, if it receives a beacon from another uh, radio or from a digipeter uh, that has that emergency mic E set, it will pop up. This is what the pop-up screen would look like. It comes up in red on the radio and it, uh, with an emergency and it, and it has a horn that goes 12 times. Beep, beep, beep. It, it really uh, sets off a reaction. Use it with caution, but it's nice to know that that function exists. A lot of people don't know how to use that function properly, the mic E function. So make it a point, if you've got an APRS radio, make it a point that you know how you can program that and not just with the, with the computer programming, but actually from your own faceplate. If you're ever in an emergency situation, you can set this, it will set off an alarm all over the place. So somebody will see that and transmit that information to the proper authorities that, hey, we've, we've, got a, we've received an emergency notice. It's at this location. It's from this person in this call sign. Okay, very important function. Okay, beacon hops, transmission intervals. APRS is essentially local. It's local, real-time information. You don't need to know who's up here in Edmonton or Montana if you're driving around in Calgary. Uh, so the number of repeats is defined in the packet. So stick with it. Most radios these days that have pre-programmed uh, and software that's used to program uh, trackers and things like that come preset with wide 1-1 one, one and wide 2-1. And that tells it that basically it's going to take two hops before it go, if uh, just two digipeats. In Calgary and in the foothills and in the surrounding areas, uh, two hops is plenty. That's all it takes to get into the uh, get into the uh, into an eye gate. There are enough eye gates around. You have to understand your local system. If you were really in a in a true wilderness situation, then you might go to three. But for the love of God, don't put too many hops in because what it does is clutter up the system with too many packets. The other thing is to have smart beaconing. A lot of the trackers and radios can do smart beaconing that's proportional to your speed that you're moving. A moving station every two minutes might be appropriate. A fixed station 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, Bob uh, Brunega has recommended 20 minutes. He says that you should be able to, even if you're in a strange city, turn on your APRS radio for 20 minutes in the course of 20 minutes, you should be able to find out everything there is to know about all the repeaters that are in the area, what frequencies they're on, and how many users are out and about in the area, and what frequencies they are on. So about 20 minutes, you should be able to pick up everything you need to know. When the beacons come into a radio, the APRS equipped radio, and this happens to be a snapshot from uh, my FTM 400. It's a Yezu radio. It's one of the fancier new ones. And we'll talk about equipment. Nice uh, uh, color touch screen on it. And you can see it lists all the packets that it's received, uh, all the uh, beacons that it's received. You can click on any one of the beacons on the list and it will give you this kind of information. Uh, speed, course, altitude, position comment, latitude. This one says that it's 0 0.3 kilometers to the west. Uh, that means that I had traveled, I guess, 300 meters since that last beacon occurred. <laughs> because where I am now is 300, because I was looking at my own beacon. But it tells you, it, it, so what it does is it tells you if you hear another station, oh, well, that, that guy is 50 kilometers east of me right? And the little green dot will move around to indicate east, right? Okay. If you get through, and uh, this goes through to the, uh, to the internet and through an eye gate, then it will be picked up um, by various pieces of software on the internet system. And uh, APRS.fi is one of my favorites. It's an internet site in Finland of all places that plots fixed and mobile beacons on Google Maps displays the station information, the telemetry, the raw packets, the messages. It's a, it's a pretty good site. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of a, a, a capture of what uh, the kind of information 
that comes up. Uh, you can see that there are some, uh, a mobile station will have a track behind it. The other fixed uh, objects or stations are, uh, are indicated. The WX, the blue WX dots are weather stations. The black diamonds are, um, uh, there are eye gates or digipeters. They're, they're eye gates. If you click on a station, it will give you more information. This is what uh, comes up. You can you see the Mikey message that I talked about earlier. Uh, and this one, it says in service. That's the one that could say emergency. Uh, it gives you a location, last position, when it happened, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. All of it's there. It's great stuff. Take a look. It tells you the stations that are near your current position. Or, and it tells you stations which have heard that that uh, beacon, uh, not that particular beacon, but heard that station directly on the radio and when they heard it. Okay, so that's the base. That's the the uh, the system that uh, that we have. So let's let's take a look a little bit further on uh, on uh, the equipment that you can use. I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. Um, and uh, I know this might be a little bit like uh, trying to uh, rush the information, but we have a limited length of time and we do want to get to uh, more uh, detailed stuff about APRS messaging. So the kind of equipment you can have, a, you, need to, you need to have a radio, you need to have a GPS, and you need to have a TNC. So sometimes they're all built into one unit. So that could be an HT or a mobile. Sometimes the GPS is external and the TNC is external and then they can connect that to the radio. And sometimes it's just a one-way tracker that it sends out your presence and position, but it can't receive or display messages. And sometimes it can be a mobile phone. And that's a little bit of a cheat because there's no radio and we're hands, right? We want to use the radio. Okay. Kenwood. We're early implementers and they're still very good implementers. Kenwood worked with Bob Bruninga and to implement it. And one of the nicest implementations is on the Kenwood D710. Uh, the, the advantage is that it has, um, it has all the APRS functions built in, but it also has two-way communication to the laptop or a tablet. So it's two-way and you can, you can use the radio as a dumb TNC and let the laptop or tablet control everything and they can send and receive messages and you can type on your laptop and you can have the map display on your uh, on your laptop or tablet or even on a on a phone but it has to be a wired connection the disadvantage of the the 710 it has no touch screen message input on the radio and it has uh, it doesn't happen to have another digital mode well that's that's in uh, irrelevant to APRS but it doesn't have the other voice digital. This is the one that I talked about earlier. I, I use this one, the FTM 400. Uh, there's a shot of it. The advantage is that it's got a full APRS implementation. It has a touch screen for message text input, which will be important to us when we get to talking about messages. It also happens to have C4FM digital voice on uh, in the same radio. As I said, irrelevant to the to APRS, but nice to have. The disadvantage is that it has an output that's only one way. So you can, in fact, display your map data on a tablet or a laptop, but you can't set up on the tablet or laptop and use the radio just as a TNC and then send your data two ways from the tablet to the, to the radio and the radio to the tablet. It only goes one way, and that's out to the tablet to display information, but you can't use it to input to the radio. Then there are the HTs. They're very popular. They, the advantage is that they're built in, uh, they have the built-in GPS and the TNC, and they send and receive beacons and messages. The disadvantage is it's a small screen. There's no touch input. They're much more expensive than a regular HT, about double and more. And they have a rather complex menu system. So hands are notoriously cheap, but a lot of them are, are springing for these uh, expensive HTs that do the complete package. By far, the cheapest solution to get into APRS is, uh, well, I guess the, the cheapest is to do nothing but just use your cell phone. We'll get to that in a moment. But the second cheapest is to connect your cell phone to an HT or some other radio with a, with a, with a uh, wire. And uh, that's all you need, just the connection wire, nothing more. The, the, um, 
the there are pro programs for Android called APRS Droid and iOS. There's one called Pocket Packet. There's others on the on, on iOS that don't work so well, and um, uh, they they send their messages when they want to transmit. the The uh, cell phone will generate uh, a a packet audio, and then the radio receives it just as a, as an audio input, and you use voice operated transmit put VOX to send it out. And similarly, the, the cell phone is listening to the audio coming from the radio and it, it can decode packets coming in. The disadvantage of this system, although it is inexpensive, is that it's fussy to set up. It often only transmits or only receives, but not both. What happens is that, that, in, that the, especially the, the inexpensive Chinese radios, when they receive, they, if you have squelch on, the squelch doesn't open fast enough to get the packet header to to get the packet to send to your cell phone. It's, they're, they're just too slow. They're, they're, they're not a high performance radio. Uh, so what you end up doing is that if you want to listen, then you got to open the squelch and then the radio is continuously in receive mode so that when you want to transmit a beacon, it, it won't transmit because it's using VOX and, and the radio is always in receive. So then you say, well, I, I, I want to be able to transmit beacons. So then you put it on, you put the squelch, say, on one on a low setting. And then, yeah, it'll transmit just fine, but you'll never receive anything because the, the uh, like I said before, the squelch doesn't open fast enough. So it's fussy and it doesn't work hellish well, but it does work. And here's an example. One of our local hams, uh, Amir, VA6QAS, used this system to go all the way to, um, to uh, BC. And you can see that there's his track. It worked. So, you know, there's no denying it. It, it, it does work. Okay. Then you can, uh, uh, a second level is where there are these things are called micro trackers. Uh, you can get them from Bionics, one from Argent Data. The one on the right there is the one that's got a USB and a little red case. That one uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about. Uh, the advantage of these are they're inexpensive. They're not too, too expensive. They pair with a GPS or a radio to transmit position package. And some of them, like the one on the right there, have uh, onboard GPS. The disadvantage is, is that some of these tiny trackers have no receive or display. Tiny Tracker 4 does from Bionics, but it's already over $100, right? Okay, this one is the Argent Data T3 Micro, and that's the one with the red case removed. I think actually when you buy it, you might just get the bare bones board and you have to buy that little red case to put around it separately. But look at the size of it, and it has built in GPS. Uh, and uh, here on the left, uh, you can that is a uh, eighth inch pin, um, a four barrel pin to um, to connect to your radio for the pin. It puts the PT, it sends and receives the audio, and it has the PTT in the ground for on the four four uh, parts of that. And it just plugs into now the USB side of it can be plugged into just a battery, and then that's it. Uh, you you pre-program the the uh, beacon uh, comments that you want, and it will it will work just fine that way. And uh, our uh, friend um, uh, Vince VE6LK, who's up on the second presentation, built a number of trackers for use with the MS Bike Tour using this this one. And in fact, uh, it was the these photos are courtesy of Vince. Another one that you can use is the is the um, MobileLink TNC3. It's full two-way TNC with a wire to the radio. You can see it there on the left, and um, and then it has a and then it has Bluetooth to an Android tablet. It works great. It uses any HD with the right connection cable. You can build your own cable. Full APRS Droid functions. Smart beacon mapping message open source full software so you can turn any you don't have to buy the expensive integrated radio you can buy a good quality re, uh, HT and then you can get one of these TNCs to pair with it and then you've got all the functions of that eight hundred dollar HT okay well maybe not quite all but I might exaggerate slightly there but he's got virtually the same okay uh, the disadvantage is one extra piece of external gear. 
Okay, there's also, you can cheat. You don't have to have a radio. You can use your iPhone or Android programs. The advantage is that you can beacon your presence without additional hardware. You can send or receive messages. Disadvantages, you need the cell phone connection. And it's no good for an emergency or when you're off the grid. Those are the basics. Um, sorry to, uh, to rush them slightly, but we wanted to get to this part of it. APRS messaging. One of the most important things that you can do with an APRS radio is send and receive messages when you don't have a cell phone connection or when the internet is, or when, the, uh, or when you're out of cell phone range, okay? I was about to say when the internet is down, but that's not true. You need the internet for, the, for some of these, but for, uh, for some of them you don't. For radio to radio, it can be, it's completely, independent of the internet and is completely independent of uh, cell phones. The radio to SMS and the radio to email do require an internet connection uh, at some point. It's not like if the, if the internet is down locally, you can use this to get out to an area where it is, you can, uh, where uh, iGate is connected to the internet. Let's start with radio to radio messages. APRS has, a, has structured itself to, to use messages in a, in a packet that contain up to 66 characters of, uh, of uh, uh, text. And most input to the radios is done by the twist and push method or the DTMF pad on the microphone. Some of them have touchscreen keyboards. That's why I particularly like that TNC uh, mobile link because it links to the keyboard that you can uh, you get the display all the beautiful display and input capabilities of your of your phone connected. Uh, the um, the other method of putting in uh, text is uh, I think we've all gone through it. You know, you just twist the dial around until you come A B C D E, click, and you go E, click, and then six. Da, 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 click and that's you know it's laborious and it's slow the other way to do it is to use the uh, touchpad on your uh, the uh, the buttons on your microphone you need a DTMF microphone to do that and then you do it the way that we did when when cell phones first came out we thought it was cool then but now we, we would hate to have to go back to it but it can be done so that means that on the two button it's ABC so you click the two button once for a twice for B three times for C you know the drill and uh, so you can input text that way. Again, it's fairly slow. And then some of them have touchscreen keyboards like the FTM 400. And the address that you send a message to another um, APRS user is their, their uh, call sign with the dash with their system ID. So you send it out to VA6PJB-9. Okay, if you're, and, and you compose a message on your radio and the radio has a message input function. You click through to the message input function and you compose your message and you click send and away it goes. And uh, the radio will transmit that message until it receives an acknowledgement back from the destination radio. So it'll go like, uh, usually it's about four or five times, sometimes as much as seven. So it just starts transmitting the message and listening for the acknowledgement coming back. Oh, I didn't get the acknowledgement transmit it again. So it does that over uh, over the course of uh, uh, the first couple are within a couple uh, within a minute of each other and then it stretches it out. It's got an algorithm for not keep blip 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 but it stretches it out but eventually it gives up because it hasn't received an acknowledgement. If it does receive an acknowledgement then 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 game on. You know that you know that your message has reached the other radio and you wait for a reply to come back. Okay. Now this is real time. It's two-way messaging. It's real time two-way messaging when the both radios are on and both operators are present. Okay, it doesn't have any store or forward. So if one radio is off, the message is missed. Okay. The second way of sending messages on APRS is to send it to an SMS text. That is, you know, your standard text that you get on your cell phone. So you address the message to SMS GTE. So that is as if that were the call sign, okay? So it's the SMS gateway. So SMS GTE, you don't put a dash seven, dash nine, dash anything, you just leave off the SSID, okay? 
So you, so you get on your radio, you get into the message function, and you put in SMS GTE. Then you go, and then you, then you click through to start inputting the text of the message. The very first thing you put in the text of the message is an at sign, and then you put the phone number of the destination. Okay, so the message goes through. It goes on, as, as we mentioned before, boing, boing, hits an eye gate, eye gate grabs it, and then it puts it into the internet system, IS system, and the, an SMS server will, will, that's been programmed by a guy here in Canada uh, grabs that and translates it and puts it out on the phone system. And it delivers it to, to, uh, to your destination phone. And the person who receives that message on the phone gets a text. The text says that it, came, it comes from SMS GTE. So you know how the text identify the sender. And then the very first part of the text says at, and it gives you your call sign and dash seven or dash nine or whatever. So VA6, BJB-7, and then a space, and then your text that you sent, okay? The receiving phone can, all they have to do to send a message back to you is just respond the way they usually do on a text message. You gotta give them the heads up though. It's a limited size. It's only 57 characters. Any characters beyond 57 will be truncated. So, you know, tell, if, you're, if you think you're gonna send someone to it, tell them answer in really short sentences and use multiple messages if you have to, okay? Uh, th it's unlikely that they're gonna count the number of characters, but I suppose someone could, but just tell them, you know, one line, just only one line message coming back, okay? The thing about this system is that the phone can't initiate the exchange. You can't just pick up your phone and, and dial away and say you're going to send it. For one thing, you don't know the number. You see, the, the way that they, they prevent spam on the APRS network is that it, the, the phone number is not given out publicly, and you only get it as a result of a text, having received a text from an APRS station. Okay? But there is a huge advantage. You can send and receive to any cell phone in North America. He hasn't implemented the international yet. The responses from uh, the SMS, if, so if the person you send something to your wife or your friend and uh, they, they respond, but you've left the radio, you've gone away or you, because they didn't get it in time and you're now gone, it'll hold it for 24 hours. So if you're the guy who's out in the field or the gal who's out in the field and you've sent your message and uh, you haven't received a response, the next time you turn on your radio it says, well, I didn't receive a response from, from, uh, from Colleen. I wonder what happened. You can, you, you type question mark, APRS and M for message, and you send that to SMS gate and it will respond. I've got some screenshots here from, uh, and uh, this is from a Yaesu FTM 350, the earlier version, it had a, it had a monochrome screen. It's the earlier version of what the 400 is now. It doesn't have the color screen and doesn't have the touch screen input, but uh, it works quite well. And it's got a good APRS implementation. So this is the uh, Yesu 350. And it uh, happened to be the one that was on my desk when I was making this presentation. Okay. Uh, so this is an example. You can see that it was addressed to SMS GTE. And uh, then the phone number was put on there and then it was a test to SMS, okay? This is an example of the uh, message that, uh, that you can send to SMS gate to ask it, have you got any messages that were held for me, right? Um, and uh, there it is, it responded with this one. This is what the message looks like when it comes back from a cell phone. It it, uh, it, um, it said, this is a message sent from an APR when the APRS radio is not on, okay? Uh, one of the, th like I said, there's a 57 character uh, uh, minimum, uh, maximum, but you can uh, set up aliases, you can set up shortcuts, uh, you can go on the APR SMS GTE site and find out what they are. You can also, okay, the second thing you can do about messaging is that you can actually send them a radio to email. This is a little bit more fussy, and you'll see, see why as I go. You can address the message, you send it to a email, dash two, 
okay? So this time there is an SSID, okay? And the first part of the, of the, uh, of the thing right here is your destination uh, email address, and then the message was test 10, okay? Uh, when you send it, the radio, if it gets the acknowledgement, will come back and it'll give you this message on your screen. It says the email was sent. Okay, so that's nice. Tells you that. This is what it looks like when the person on the other end gets it. Now, it's a little bit confusing because I'm sending and this is a, this is an incestuous message. I'm sending it to myself, right? <laughs> okay, so this is what the what it looks like. The VA six PJB dash ten colon test ten. That's the subject line of the message. That in fact is the message. The message is in the subject line. Okay. And this is from VA6PJB-10, and it says test 10 was the message. But then you see what it says? It says, do not reply. Okay, so this is a one-way message from your radio to email. However, there is a workaround. If you want the person to be able to reply and get a message back to your radio from the email system, so that means that they would type an email and send it, it would go to an eye gate. It would go to the eye gate that last heard your radio. And then that eye gate would transmit it out to your radio. Okay. Then you have to coach them on what you want. the. So if you want the recipient to be able to reply, then you have to set up an alias. You send a message to email two that has in its body the nickname. Here you can see that I, I put in the nickname hot. Okay, that's how you set up an alias, and it responds and it says, that alias was added, hot was added, okay? Then, once the alias is set up, and you've previously coached the recipient on how to format their response, they can reply. The message goes in the subject line. They put the message in the subject line, so they type out your, so they, 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 they can reply, the message goes to VA6 PJB-10. That happened to be the thing I had set up for that particular radio, with a colon. So they type that into their subject line, and they type the message, test 10 was received from you. And then in the body, there's nothing goes in the body of the email except this, the word user ID, colon, and then their alias, and then colon. And that, me and that allows that the APRS system to identify that the email to system to identify that this is an authorized person they are allowed to send a message to that radio because that radio person has set them up with an alias okay so that's what has to be done so you can do the radio the received message from the alias this is what it looks like when it hits your radio it came from hot that's the alias you set up and it was received by um, uh, from you. Okay, we're coming up on 44 minutes here. We're going to try to limit this to 45. So I don't, I think we're going to go over slightly, but not much. And then we'll have time for questions. Oh, by the way, the email sender received a delivery confirmation. Uh, that's what they got back. The PRS message, hot, uh, test 10 received from you. It was sent. And so they get an email message say it was sent to, to the radio and it was acknowledged. Okay. Now, the point is, this is a true store and forward. Uh, that return message that's coming back from the email, uh, uh, from the SMS gate, it's only for uh, 24 hours. For the, uh, I think this, it's indefinitely stored, or at least for a month or so, but I don't know that for a fact. This saves the message. If it can't get it out to your radio, it, it, um, it just uh, holds it, okay? It tries, like it tries four or five times to get you, and if it can't get you, then, then it just holds on to it. So if the radio is off and the recipient replies, the sender will get a message in their email that's saying delivery was delayed. And when the operator comes back on, he or she sends a message, and they send it to email too, because they know they, I sent something to Joe, and I haven't received a reply, so I'll just send the message to the email to system, and it's get, G-E-T. Email two will respond and it'll spit out any messages that are waiting for you. Okay. Um, 
and uh, the email tool will respond by sending the stored uh, missed messages and it also sends an email to the sender to the confirm the delivery. Look at that, 8.46. That's, <laughs> that was the uh, time that included the introductory remarks. So uh, I hope I didn't speed through this too fast. Uh, that's the uh, presentation. That's the conclusion of uh, the, um, the presentation on the messaging. Um, for there, uh, I'll put in a plug here for uh, within CARA, within the Calgary Amateur Radio Association, we have a group called the VHF Interest Group. They meet on the third Tuesday of every month at the Denny's that's on um, 16th Avenue East uh, between Deerfoot and Barlow Trail. Uh, obviously that's not happening these days. So they have turned their meeting into a net on uh, the RYC repeater. So tomorrow night, uh, no, Tuesday of this week, this is uh, uh, coming up um, on uh, the 21st on 7.30 p.m. on the repeater VE6 RYC in Calgary. And it just so happens that the, the topic for this uh, uh, month's meeting was going to be APRS as a follow-up to this presentation where participants were gonna bring in their gear and show people, this is hands-on. Okay, you've seen stuff on screen, but they're gonna bring real hands-on stuff and say, this is what I have, this is the way I do it. Because there's so many different ways that people do it. Instead, uh, they, what they've done is they posted pictures of their gear. Various people have said, okay, this is the way I do it. They take some pictures of it. They put that on the, the VHF forum that's on caraham.org. And then they're going to get on the radio and talk about it on the, uh, on the, uh, the repeater. Uh, the problem is that that particular forum is for members only. So I know that a lot of you, I'd say about two thirds of the registrants for this seminar are, uh, are maybe half, half, more than half are CARA members. So you can, uh, for the others, you're welcome to join on the, uh, on the uh, repeater uh, that's totally open, but uh, the forum itself happens to be in the members only area of the CARA site. With that, we'll say uh, that we can move on to questions. You want a little bit of humor in the middle of all this COVID? Check out Stay the Blazes Home by the Stanfields. It's, it's a great story about uh, how that came to be with the Premier of Nova Scotia getting peeved at the people and telling them to stay the blazes home. And they, these guys turned it into a song. All right, with that, I'll turn it back to Dana. And uh, let's take, uh, we're about three minutes over time, uh, not too bad. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll let Dana then uh, uh, say whether or not there's some questions that have come in on the chat line. We do have a couple there, Peters, uh, VA6DJH. Uh, Dana, relaying questions. Um, questions, we can accept them on, uh, in the chat on the Zoom meeting. And so I have a couple. Um, so just, uh, I guess we can start uh, at the beginning there. Uh, APRS, just, just overall APRS. Question from uh, Jim, V6GO. Uh, about uh, how do you pick your path length? And so, I mean, you could set it up for a wide, you know, four dash three, et cetera, or a wide two, two, or a wide two, one, uh, or some of these options. And the uh, question is, okay, how would you know how to set your path length? Okay, uh, the, the recommendation uh, for everyone uh, on the system, certainly in the Calgary area, is to make your path length only two wide one and one and wide two one. That's two hops. Two hops is plenty. More than that clutters the system. Uh, in fact, the, the, the radio, not my radio, the, the modern one, the 400 came pre-programmed that way. And when you read the documentation, it says, leave it, leave it on the pre-programmed, but it's, it's, you can change it. This is how you change it, but we recommend that you don't. Uh, and uh, and so, but if you were really out in the wilderness, uh, away from civilization, and you knew that it would take more than two hops to get to a to an eye gate, then sure, increase it. Is there a way of knowing if you'd be uh, like if you're out in a rural area, if you, if you would be within two hops or not? Um, I don't know. We'll have to think about that when I get back to you on that one. <laughs> Okay, there, there was a similar one uh, from VA6AMX uh, about is there a database where you can look up uh, different eye gate locations or a way to find out where uh, eye gates are and that, that may be a similar sort of uh, 
question. Yes, I think so. Uh, on APRS.fi, I think you can tell. Uh, you know what? I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, you should be able to click on the information on APRS.fi and find out if something's an ID. And, and so I don't know if I'd call that a, well, it is sort of a database, but it's, it's more of live information. So you'll have current eye gates. So I guess that are currently active. If they report their own position, you'd be able to see that uh, from a map yep. view on a view yep. like APRS.fi. There was some discussion about the um, SMS gate. Mm -hmm. And the question of SMS gate is, uh, do you need uh, sort of for long distance, do you need the uh, number one uh, for, for if you're going to send an SMS message? I don't think so, uh, but I don't know that for a fact. Uh, oh. I, I think uh, it can't hurt to put it on there, right? <laughs> Okay, so, so the SMS gate uh, service then, it, it, do you know if that's primarily North America or if I wanted to send that to somebody in Germany, would that work? It won't work to send something in, from Canada to Germany. Uh, the, it's just that it, it costs money to, to set up these servers with their patch to a, uh, to a, uh, to a phone account and uh, it's all voluntary. Oh, by the way, there is a, you, you can go, go to the SMS GTE site on the internet SMSGT, SMSGTE.org. And, uh, and if you use the service at all, uh, make a donation. I made a donation to them uh, because uh, the, it's, it's all volunteer and it's all funded through donations. And okay, so we, it is limited to only North America for the moment. And we'll see in the future whether the guy expands it. And uh, thank you to Dustin V6SVN, who is uh, in the chat there has confirmed that no, you don't need uh, number one. It, it, it assumes that you're talking about North America when, uh, when you're doing that. There was a comment that was a good one, was uh, from uh, a user Spooky Tooth. Uh, they've tested this system um, a few years ago doing the radio SMS and found that it was easy to type on a cell phone. Typing on a radio was a pain, just, just like your comments there, Peter. And he, he referenced uh, Jerry V6AB on his uh, website who had a, a setup where, for using a keyboard into a TNC. And that's, uh, I think that was to a tiny track from a PS2 keyboard that, uh, that he's uh, done for that one. So that, that, that's, a, that's a, a, good, a good way of using, you know, keyboard, putting a keyboard onto a radio. The... Um, there was also a, an equipment specific one. I, I think you have one of the FTM 400s, uh, Peter. I don't know if you would have tried it out in this way. And it had to do with uh, using the Bluetooth module in it is if that was a way of getting uh, some of this information from the radio into your, uh, or sorry, from your, your phone into the radio. And uh, sort of one of the thoughts that we had were, um, was uh, was okay. I was wondering uh, maybe it might work if you feed the audio feed into uh, APRS Droid or something. I, I don't know if they're set up to do the data side. Um, we think in general it's probably not going to work for that. But uh, I'm curious if you've tried the uh, Bluetooth. Uh, you know what? Uh, it's a good idea. I haven't tried it. I haven't found a way to get easy text input into the 400. Oh, well, the 400. Though of course, uh, it, it, it it's. It's almost a moot point because it's got a touch screen uh, text entry anyway. It comes up with a QWERTY keyboard right on the uh, uh, right, right on the radio. But I suppose it would be more convenient, uh, like when you got it in the car and you got it up on the dashboard. You have to kind of hunch over and lean forward and start touching the radio screen to type in your text. It'd be faster if you did it on your phone. So I'm going to look into that. That's a good idea. Check it out. I don't know the answer. Could, it could be quite interesting. Um, I, I don't know. I know Kenwood has the built-in KISS uh, TNCs that if you can get a serial connection to it, then you can use them. I, I don't know that uh, Yesu does quite the same thing in, in some of their radios. Yesu, Yesu it, it consistently in the 350, in the 100, and the 400 have had the one-way connection out to display the map information, but doesn't accept the input coming back in the other direction. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, one comment about the uh, APRS FI. The uh, if 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 FI gates are using the correct uh, display symbol, um, that they they'll show as an I with a, and a black diamond, and so you could find uh, it similar for the Digipeters D for a Digipeter to find those on the map display. Um, a stylus helps a ton on the 400 from V6CV. 
the uh, uh, comment. Uh, uh, yeah, that was a comment there. And uh, I guess actually one question about uh, software TNCs like Direwolf uh, is is that a good way to go? Advantage. Yeah, I didn't even touch on that. That's another other way to do it is with the uh, with the Direwolf on uh, on a on a Raspberry Pi. There's so many possibilities there. It's there's another world there. The um, see, so look at our time here. We're we're about five minutes before the next presentation. Um, I guess any final questions? We should uh, ha have those off there. Um, uh, most likely, will be some discussion about Dire Wolf on Tuesday night. I would imagine. Well, thank you very much all for your attention. Um, and uh, hope you uh, got something out of this presentation. And uh, we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to be back uh, with, uh, with uh, Vince, who's going to uh, talk to us about uh, vector network analyzers. <laughs>